Hey everyone, Wolflord Row here. Today we continue our discussion on the first founding chapter monasteries. General spoiler warning to begin as today we will be referencing events from across the Warhammer 40k universe. So you have been warned, and with that said let's just jump straight in. So for me, the homes of the first founding chapters are some of the most hallowed and revered names across the entire Imperium. Things that are integral to these fabled chapters identity, as any chapter master ever was. They are the link that binds the current day chapters back to the mythical past of the Primarchs. And so I wanted to give these bastions of defense their due, their time in the spotlight. In part 1 we discuss the homes of the Dark Angels, the White Scars, the Space Wolves and the Imperial Fists. And today we begin with the Blood Angels and the Arx Angelicum. The Fortress Monastery of the Blood Angels is located upon the world of Baal. Compared to some of its fellow first founding Fortress Monasteries, it had what I would say are varied stages of its life. Built upon an extinct volcano, after centuries of intense labour, the Ark itself came to embody its one-time legion. A volcano, the finest representation of nature's inner fury, overlaid with the beauty and ornamentation the angels are renowned for. It's really the perfect symbol of the blood angels themselves. Within Sanguinius's Primarch novel, The Great Angel, we were able to see it at its very earliest, when the construction was only a century in. I caught sight of our destination just before the re-entry flames scrubbed it from view. It was a volcano, or two of them perhaps. Mingled and sprawling, a giant stepped mass of cracked and darkened rock rising from fractured plains of rust-coloured soil. And yet it couldn't have been a volcano, not a live one, extinct maybe, or its magma chambers drained and plugged, with only its ossified superstructure remaining to build and remould and raise higher. I squinted, pushing my face up against the armour glass, and saw the construction equipment swarming all over it, Earth moving machines crawling, dust clouds blooming, right up against the soaring walls. It goes to show just how monolith and gargantuan the fortress monasteries are. Here, over a century into its construction, the Arx Angelicum is still a complete building site. And from here at its earliest, and throughout the following Great Crusade, the Arx Angelicum was at its peak, bustling with the weight and numbers required to service a full legion of the Emperor. Though Baal was a system few were permitted to enter, the magnificence of the Angel's home remained with any who were blessed to witness it. For here was a fortress guided by the very mind and direction of Sanguinius himself one of, if not the, most artistic of Primarchs. Unfortunately, with the coming of the heresy, the legions would turn against each other, tearing the Imperium asunder. And with Gilliman's ultimate breaking of the legions into chapters, the Arx Angelicum would feel that loss greatly. Reduced to housing a mere thousand marines, the fortress became a mere ghost house of its former self, and the blood angels of all the bloodlines struggled most of all to even retain that low fighting number. So over the centuries that followed, vast portions of this proud home of angels was lost to the desert, covered by the great dust storms that swept across the world and quite simply left to their fate. That was until Dante, current leader of the Blood Angels chapter, ordered all areas of the Arx Angelicum to be reclaimed and restored from the desert. 
With the coming of Leviathan, he not only needed to prepare his world to face this threat, but he also needed space to house the full complement of successor chapters. 10,000 years after the Blood Angels Legion was disbanded, the outer reaches of the fortress were reclaimed from the desert. As forgotten halls and passages were restored to their former glory, the Arx Angelicum was the sole fortress monastery of all the first founding chapters to relive its purpose of housing a legion. Not even the Codex ignoring Space Wolves could have matched the Angelicum's glory in that moment of time. Sanguinius would be proud. As we know, the devastation of Baal would follow, and though the angels would win, they would win barely, and the Arx Angelicum would feel the wrath of Hive Fleet Leviathan. Even still now, bearing its scars, as can be seen from the novel Darkness in the Blood. Dante had commissioned the Chamber of the Great Red Council for the gathering of the blood before Leviathan struck. It had been despoiled along with the rest of the Arx Angelicum. Little was contained within its huge hall that would have been of interest to the Predator, but the Tyranids had treated the chapter spitefully. No piece of art or commemoration was left untouched. Everywhere they had torn down the monuments and destroyed the art. Large sections of the chamber were screened off. There was centuries worth of work in the Arx Angelicum to repair the damage. Though the home of the angels may never have rivaled the Fang in might, though it may never eclipse the name of the Fortress of Hera in popularity, there are few, if any, fortress monasteries that are as revered. For this was the place Sanguinius himself called home. Right now, it bears the scars of its near annihilation. However, the Lord Commander himself, Rebute Gilliman, has decreed the Arx Angelicum will be restored to its former glory, and he has dedicated huge forces of the Mechanicum to do so. Moving on, we have the Iron Hands. The chapter of the Iron Hands are one vastly departed from their Primarch's intentions. In witnessing the early signs of their desire for the machine, Ferris himself resolved to rid them of this plight in the aftermath of the Great Crusade. As we know, this was a future the Primarch would never live to see. Though Ferris's death has altered his son's fate in a way he would no doubt lament, his embracement of Medusan culture is something that, thankfully, lived on. Medusa, the homeworld of Ferris and the Iron Hands Legion, is a death world. Virtually no sunlight penetrates the atmosphere. The weather is storm violent and temperamental. The temperature is freezing, and it's a miracle human life existed at all. The people of Medusa long existed as clans of warring factions, sealed away within vast mobile vehicles. Such was and is their isolation and civilization. Each clan has its own language and culture, dedicated solely to their own survival. As such, the Iron Hands chapter embraces this tradition still to this day, as Ferris Manus decreed. Though the Legion and following chapter more than had the resources to build a fortress monastery, perhaps the greatest of all considering their technological might, they instead have remained as the culture of their world dictates. Each company of the chapter, clans as the Iron Hands call them, have their own mobile fortresses, also known as land behemoths. Though not too much detail is known about these clan headquarters, what is known is that they are aptly named for they are massive in size. Each behemoth houses 
the clan's own barracks and armory, thousands of chapter serfs and servants, not to mention the unbridled firepower the Iron Hands can bring to bear. During an attempted chaos invasion in the 13th Black Crusade, all ten behemoths unified to face the opposing enemy force. It's safe to say the Iron Hands won that encounter. The sheer firepower unleashed by the combined might of the fortresses must have been a truly devastating sight to behold. So though the chapter itself thus boasts no single fortress monastery, perhaps the closest thing that could be described as such would be the Gorgon's Forge. Now the Gorgon's Forge is one of the few permanent structures on Medusa, and undoubtedly by far the greatest. Though it's described as a fortress shrine, it's subcontinent in size, big enough to generate its own climate, and the entire thing is not only shrouded by some of the most powerful void shields in existence, but also has a 600 mile long corridor filled with titan killing weaponry. It's no wonder it's believed to have been built by Ferris Manus himself. The Iron Hands do not mess about. This is a structure bigger and more powerful than most fortress monasteries in existence. Here the greatest artifacts of the chapter reside, as well as vehicles of any clan awaiting repair. It is also where the honoured dreadnought sarcophagi slumber, between the times they are called to war once more. So though Medusa is a grim world at the best of times, it is undeniable. It remains a bastion of the Imperium's might. Next, we have the Ultramarines and the Fortress of Hera. True to the nature of Macrag that Rabute Gilliman found himself raised in, the home of the Ultramarines is far more than just a simple fortress monastery. As the capital and jewel of Ultramar, Macrag is the center of Ultramarian civilization and the home of the Ultramarines represents that in equal fashion. Of course, it is a fortress first and foremost, boasting all the weapon placements, void shields, defenses that you would come to expect. It has to operate for the one-time Ultramarines Legion, and now Chapter. So of course it contains everything needed to house the thousands of legionaries from barracks to armories to training facilities. However, it also represents everything Gilliman wanted for Ultramar too. So alongside the glorious banners and statues of victories and heroes, it was a center of learning, of education, housing the great library of Ptolemy, one of the great repositories of knowledge outside of Holy Terror. Every inch of the fortress was designed by Gilliman himself, and so for every mark of beauty, there remains a hidden strategic advantage. The Fortress of Terror is a masterpiece of strategic engineering. Undoubtedly for me, by far and away the greatest glimpse of the Fortress of Hera I have ever personally received was in my very first 40k novel read, Nightbringer, where Captain Uriel Ventris visited the shrine of Rabute Gilliman, when Gilliman was still frozen in stasis upon the moment of his death. Like much of the Fortress of Hera, the temple was said to have been designed by Rabute Gilliman, its portions defying the mind with the scale of its construction and the grandeur of its ornamentation. Multicolored radiance spilled from a massive archway ahead of him, light from the low evening sun shimmering through the stained glass dome in gold, azure, ruby and emerald rays. 
the multitude of pilgrims parted before him, his status as one of the emperor's chosen, granting him hushed precedence over their desire to lay their eyes on the blessed Gilliman. As always, his breath caught in his throat as he emerged into the awesome, humbling presence of the Primarch. And he cast his eyes downwards, unworthy of allowing his gaze to dwell upon his chapter's founding father for too long. The massively armoured form of Rabute Gilliman, Primarch of the Ultramarines, sat upon his enormous marble throne, entombed these last 10,000 years within the luminous stasis field. Gathered around the Primarch's feet were his weapons and shield, and, behind him, the first banner of Macrag, said to have been woven from the shorn hair of a thousand martyrs and touched by the Emperor's own hand. As someone whose first ever codex was the second edition Ultramarines one, I can't tell you how chillingly awesome this moment is. It's so hard to describe, now that years and years later we have Primarchs returned, living and breathing and moving around the galaxy. However then, it seemed beyond impossible. They were truly figures of legend and myth. And here, within the Temple of Hera, sat Rabute Gilliman himself. It gave me goosebumps when I read about it in the second edition codex as a kid. It gave me goosebumps when I read Uriel visiting that very shrine. And it gives me goosebumps now. We have a lot of discussions on Gilliman's decisions and actions since he returned. And for me, that's the fun of talking lore, having those debates and discussions with each other. However, Gilliman will always remain one of my absolute favourite Primarchs, and there are very few places in the galaxy that can match his Fortress of Hera. Moving on next, we have the Salamanders and Prometheus. Now, although the Sons of Vulcan are famous for their bonds to Nocturne, their fortress monastery actually sits on the moon of Prometheus. And there's actually several reasons for this. Firstly, the tectonic upheaval of Nocturne makes Prometheus a much more stable location to build such a fortress. And in having no atmosphere, Prometheus has no native population to worry about, which if you know anything about the Salamanders, is always an important factor. Now considering the Salamanders renowned ability at the Forge, you wouldn't be surprised to know the fortress boasts a formidable amount of armour and defence weaponry. However, you may be surprised to hear, there are areas of the fortress which are forbidden to any baseline human servant, where only the salamanders themselves may walk. As the fortress monastery for the chapter, Prometheus not only acts as the spaceport and armory for the chapter, but also the training ground for its new initiates. However, unlike its fellow first founding chapters, it is only actually its veteran first company who remain garrisoned there. The rest of the chapter when not on active assignment, living amongst the people of Nocturne. But for all the skill and greatness of Prometheus, its true advantages lie with the secrets it houses. Two of the legendary artifacts of Vulcan, the first of which is the Chalice of Fire, the great forge ship which is at the heart of many salamander armaments. And then the infamous Eye of Vulcan, a defence laser so staggeringly powerful even the Adeptus Mechanicus have never been able to replicate it. So, with the home of the Salamanders, we see a unique contrast to that of the Ultramarines for example. The Salamanders living with their people, keeping their fortress away, a target not wished to be placed amongst the populace. 
whereas the Fortress of Hera is an intertwined bastion of knowledge, one filled with citizens and pilgrims by their thousands. One's not right, one's not wrong, just two homes and cultures unique to their chapter. And finally, last but by no means least, the Raven Guard. Now, the fortress monastery of the Raven Guard is known as the Raven Spire. In actual fact, the original tower Korax took from the tech guilds who ruled his world. Upon reunion with the Emperor, it was heavily converted to house his legion. Countless tons of armor plating, weapon emplacements and void shields were added by the eager Adeptus Mechanicus. As with all the fortress monasteries of the chapters, the Raven Spire is molded in the image of its chapter. Or perhaps in the Raven Spire's case, it may be the other way around. The Raven Spire has always been grim and foreboding at the best of times. The true strengths of the structure not immediately noticeable to the eye. Yet, as with the Raven Guard themselves, any underestimation by the enemy would see them swiftly corrected, for it is as powerful as any fortress monastery across the galaxy. Even if it appears neglected, the Raven Spire remains in full working order. As the Sons of Korax, the chapter care little for the pomp and ceremony of victories to be celebrated. The absolute best aspect of the home of the Raven Guard for me is the ominous and mysterious Irie and forbidden Apothecarian. As with the rest of the former Legion's homes, much of the Raven Spire now stands abandoned. The Irie is its tallest peak and one-time private quarters of Korax. Locked behind stasis, it's said to still house the growingly grief-stricken writings of the Primarch, and his presence dominates its halls as if a psychic form still lingers. Over the centuries, few chapter masters have entered their Primarch's domain, though none have ever spoken of what they found upon their return. The Forbidden Apothecarian was the site of Korax's attempts to rebuild his legion, an experimentation we know would meet failure. Despite being purged with fire and its doors sealed shut permanently, once a year, on the night known as Far Moon, beast-like howls echo from behind those locked doors, and the first company stand guard to contain whatever threat lies therein. The Raven Spire for me is absolutely one of, if not the, coolest fortress monastery out there. What an absolutely awesome aspect this is. The grim dark, foreboding place, immersed in darkness and silence, with areas sealed seemingly haunted. I mean, come on. Who wouldn't want to see the Raven Spire? But as always everyone, what do you think? Out of all the first founding chapter homes, which of those stand out for you? Which of their legacies are truly unique? Like me, do you maybe have a soft spot for the Fortress of Hera? The place that once housed the resting Rebute Gilliman? Does the Arx Angelicum stand out for you? as the home of Sanguinius? Or does the legacy of the Raven Spire pique your interest? The one fortress monastery out of all the Imperium you would just love to see. Now, I was going to throw in a mention for Titan, home of the Grey Knights today, but I think those guys deserve their own separate conversation. So we'll definitely be talking some Grey Knights soon. But as always everyone, leave your thoughts in the comments below. Huge thank you to all my subscribers, your support truly means a lot to me, it really does. If you're new, please consider subscribing to help the channel grow. And if you enjoyed this particular vid, then why not drop a like on it too. But with that said, I am off, 
and I'll see you all again real soon.